Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This time, we're joined by jazz vocalist, composer, educator, clinician, member of uh, New York Voices, Kim Nazarian. Kim, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's quite an honor. Where are you? I am in Oberlin, Ohio, in our family music room. And you have uh, collaborated with the Houston Chamber Choir. I believe it was in February of 2019. And you, you worked with the choir and then put on the program, um, I Could Write a Book. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how you and Bob Simpson came to, uh, to get connected and, and how this all came about. Yeah, well, it was through our mutual friend, Adele Garodi. And Adele is a, you know, a supporter of the Houston Chamber Choir and friends with Bob and Mariana. And uh, she's a longtime camper at the New York Voices Vocal Jazz Camp. And that's where I met Adele. And I think she got it in her brain that she wanted to bring me down to work with the choir um, because she'd had a good time uh, under my conducting skills at the, at the camp singing vocal jazz. And, uh, and she thought it would be a good match because I do have some classical foundation in my singing. And I do have, um, uh, I think, an efficient way of teaching the arrangements of uh, New York Voices or Swing or Bossa Nova or perhaps pop tunes that have jazz harmony in them. And uh, I, I think I have a way of getting to the point with, uh, with support and direction and love and passion. Talk about the, the, uh, the process of working with the Houston Chamber Choir. Obviously, it's a choir that is, that is uh, primarily classically trained and their repertoire is primarily classical. However, it's never been exclusively classical. They have, uh, they have made a foray into, uh, into the jazz repertoire on several yeah. occasions. Um, what is it that you were able to, um, to work with the choir on? What, what were your, your themes and, and subjects, etc.? Well, I mean, you walk into that room and it's just a, a room full of talent and a room full of beautiful voices and sight singing, you know, to the max. Mm. Um, but what I walked into the room with was a, a spectrum of music. We did a, a piece that was um, classically influenced. We did a pop tune, a sting tune. We did... Um, uh, I could write a book, a swing tune. Uh, I did a duet with, I pulled one of the vocalists out who had some more uh, uh, jazz chops and we did a duet together. I did a piece with a young man, a little boy from the community who was in Mariana's uh, uh, choir. Uh, we got them to improvise. We pulled up four vocalists out of that choir and they actually improvised. We got them to really listen to the band and to make a connection, to have that instrumental influence in their singing. We got them to be conversational so that their language wasn't so formal. We got them to understand subdivision, the same thing that, that the instrumentalists are thinking about. Um, we got them to utilize the lyric and the consonant consonants in the lyric to make it swing, which is different from the classical world in which all, you know, the vowel is the most important thing. In jazz, the consonant helps you swing and the vowel has to be matched to stack harmony. So there were all these different uh, ways of combining things that they already knew, but to bring other things to the forefront for, uh, to, to bring the more jazz influence out of them. Is it a question of getting them to unlearn things that they've learned, or is it more a question of taking what they've learned and giving it a slightly different application? I think it's a combination of both. 
I think you have to unlearn formal diction and you have to come closer to uh, singing the way we speak, which is what we do in jazz. We want it to be more personal, more conversational. Um, you have to have a little bit more speech in the sound. So more times than not, I don't want alto singing in their head voice because we're not going to hear it and it's not going to ring, right? Because it sounds like that. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, again, um, being able to use your speech and to trust a straight tone, to take the vibrato out so that you can hear the chord, the jazz har harmony. One of the uh, pieces that you did on the program was a, a Duke Ellington piece, Blip Blip. Yeah. And that has uh, a very strong element of scat in it. How do you teach a classically trained ensemble to scat? Well, we did some call and response. So it's kind of learning a language. It's learning to say, you know, hello, how are you? Bop, bop, luda, bop, bam, boom. Hello, how are you? Right? And yeah. to, um, to think about rhythm first, to having a really simple rhythmic idea that swings with that medium swing feel, um, to uh, shed fear so that they're actually not afraid to, to execute their idea, you know, because they all have them. You know, we're, I think we all kind of improvise in the shower or in the car or when mm -hmm. we hear something, right? There's always these ideas go going on in your head. And, and to get them to, um, to trust themselves, to perhaps rewrite a simple melody over these changes that they knew, this harmony that they know, um, and to have a conversation. And it was very short. You know, they each had like eight bars or so. So it wasn't so much like you throw them in the ocean and they have to swim. It was kind of just, you know, get your toe wet. And there was a lot of positive reinforcement and there was a lot of talent. I mean, there's natural talent. Some people just do it and they do it well. And, and we picked the four people that felt good about that and, uh, and wanted to share where they were in their progress of improvisation. We're all a work in progress as far as improvisation is concerned. Mm -hmm. And we all have to start somewhere. So, uh, so they were encouraged and they did so very well. Because it must be very difficult for uh, a member of, uh, of a, an ensemble like the Houston Chamber Choir to free themselves from the, um, the tyranny of the music staff, of, you know, of having every note uh, on the staff and bar lines and time signatures, etc. You have to be able to, for, to improvise, you have to be able to leave all that behind, don't you? Yes, but you're, it's not like you don't have a net under you. I mm -hmm. mean, there is foundation. You do have to know what the rhythmic subdivision is of what you're doing. You do have to know what the changes are, the harmonic changes are. You do have to know what the melody is. And if you can call on these, these elements of the music, then you have, you know, a little bit of support to, uh, to establish your ideas. How did you see the members of the choir develop over the course of, of the time that you were here working with them? Oh, I think we all kind of relaxed. I think, yeah, I think I was nervous when I first walked in. I don't, I'm not, wasn't quite sure that they trusted me. But then as the week went on, I think we all relaxed. We all got deeper into the music. Uh, we all allowed ourselves to have some fun. And I think they saw uh, with every rehearsal an element of success. I think they felt like they were getting closer and closer and closer to something that they would be proud to present. And it didn't feel so foreign anymore. And I think they were happy to delight their audiences uh, with this material. They were, as a matter of fact, they didn't stop singing. When the concert was over and we were downstairs packing up, they were still singing this uh, song written by my friend Guillermo Norichoitz. It's a, it was a samba called Samba de Maya. And it was wordless. Um, and they just, they kept singing. And that made me just feel so very good about the work that we had done. So how do you sing something that's wordless? Uh, Are we in the realm of vocalese here? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it depends on what it is. If it's a, um, like a samba would have uh, more L's and M's. Uh, so these, uh, these sambas and bossa novas will have more L's in them. When you get into swing stuff, you have more of your it's more information in there so that's where the but when you have to do it together everybody has to use the same syllable and it's harder right. i think than singing words yeah and it depends on who's leading or who's conducting because one improviser is going to have one choice of a syllabic uh, phrase and a, another improviser is going to have another one so we all have to decide what feels good what feels authentic, uh, what's comfortable in the mouth, what fits to the melody, and then we all have to agree, agree and do it together. And it really makes you realize that the voice is a complete instrument as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. The voice is an instrument for sure. We just have the luxury of adding lyrics to what right. we do. That's the beauty, one of the beauties of being a vocalist is that you can communicate in, in any language if you choose to learn it um, and, and sing the native tongue of the, the people where, you know, wherever you are, the origins of wherever you are. Um, but then without the lyric, then it does become that universal language. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with other classical ensembles other classical ensembles. I have worked with um, classical choirs in schools, in right. colleges, high schools, you know, sometimes middle school, they're, they're dipping into some of this repertoire. Um, and that is where uh, the, the music and the influence would, would cross pollinate. But that was my first professional classical group. Um, New York Voices worked with a choir in Stuttgart. Um, which is, uh, I believe, more classical, and uh, in Stuttgart, Germany, um, that was a beautiful thing. Hmm, that's what I'm. That's what I'm recalling as far as classical, mo mostly uh, academic. You are firmly of the opinion that that um, singing is singing. The voice is the voice, regardless of of whether it's your repertoire is is classical or it's jazz, or it's, it's, it's something else. The commonality is that idea of the ensemble. Um, the commonality for me, I guess, is the foundation. The commonality between what you do, and it's also how I teach, that you have to be mm -hmm. able to produce a healthy sound for your entire career. And how do you maintain that? And then what do you choose? How do you choose to use it? You know, it's like anything else. If you're gonna, if you're a chef, you know, you have to have good ingredients and you can make anything that you want to make as long as those ingredients are good. So, so for me, that would be, that would be the commonality, would be the healthy voice, the flexible instrument and the open mind to be able to apply that voice to anything and everything that you so choose. So how do you, how do you draw together? Um, what's your experience been of drawing together the individual voice into an ensemble, into a, a group? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends on the type of group that you are singing with uh, and the other people in the group. Um, and then you have to be able to uh, kind of shape your voice to uh, the material. For me, it's about the material first. Uh, the music is always comes first. And how do you present this material and this music authentically the best way that you know how? So there's a lot of research, there's a lot of homework, there's a lot of listening. And then there is um, practicing and adapting and creating, right? That goes on into that final that final product, but everyone has to be of the same mind. Mm -hmm. 
right? Everyone has to bring whatever percentage they are of that group, whether you're one in a hundred or you're one of four. Yes. You know, everyone has to be together. That's where the magic happens is when you are all on the same page and you are all breathing together and a hundred percent of your body is involved in the music and you truly become the vessel for the music and you truly become the conduit for the audience right what what comes through you goes to them and, and that's the gift right. that that you give them and that you leave with them you put together a uh, a repertoire for the uh, houston chamber choir performance talk about some of those pieces and why you chose those pieces i think the first was the first on the program was i could write a book the uh, rogers and hart tune from was it pal joey um i think you're right mm -hmm. what was it or what is it about this particular song that uh, made you want to start the program out with it well i think it's a good title piece first of all right yeah it is um, mm -hmm. and it's also an approachable piece it's an approachable arrangement that uh, if it's if you're gonna you know start to learn how to swing with a classical choir um this is has um the form of this arrangement i think is easy enough that you can start to digest these elements within a week and then and give it back so i think it was an approachable peace some morning yeah that's a song that uh is very close to your heart isn't it it is it is it's the title of my solo cd my one and only solo cd <clears throat> it's written by a friend of ours and one of my favorite composers uh a brazilian composer named ivan leans and uh, we kind of transformed the arrangement to, uh, to highlight the lyric um, in, in this particular piece. And uh, I think we, no, the, the, I think that was an SATB. I think everyone sang that one. Yeah. So it was, it's, a, it's also a piece where you can release. There's a raw energy about this piece toward the end. The song is, and the arrangement is really about a sunrise. So it starts off quite softly, but, and then it goes through the height of the day. And it ends with the full, full blaze of the sun. And that's kind of where we hear the full glory of the voice at the end of that piece. Also on the program was a Stevie Wonder song, yeah. If It's Magic. Mm-hmm which comes from the, uh, was it Songs in the Key of Life yeah. mm -hmm. album? Yes. Why did you put this piece on the program? It's a very, on the surface, it seems like a very simple song. On the album, it's, it's just Stevie and, uh, and a harpist. Mm -hmm. What is it that you, that you love about this song? And why did you bring it to the choir? Yeah, well, again, it was the lyric. You know, I really, I can't say anything. I can't sing anything that I don't believe. Hmm. So whatever I sing has to have a truth to it. And to me, that song is one of the utmost truths. Um, and uh, it had a really fun 6-8 uh, feel and a layer of rhythms that's quite complex. Um, and it was a good feature for the men. This was a song that I just brought the men out of the ensemble, and they were the background for this piece. Mm -hmm. Que sera sera. Yes. Wonderful song. What do you like about this song? I like that I get to uh, sing it with my son. My son is on the recording. And, oh, really? Uh, yes. We recorded it when he was about nine years old. Now he's 20. <laughs> it took me a long time to finish that record. Um, but the other thing I like about that song is that everybody knows it, and it can become this sing-along 
that so everyone can add their voice to the energy of the room and um and it's uplifting and i can feature someone you know from from either the ensemble or the community and uh, it just it feels good to share that piece in terms of your own voice where do you fall are you a soprano are you an alto or are you a countertenor? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I have sung all all the parts uh, in in New York voices and in the, the like the recording world. Uh, I am known as a soprano, but when I have to do lead work as a jazz vocalist, mm -hmm. you are using mostly uh, your alto range and your speech. Um, and on one cut of New York Voices on the Paul Simon CD on uh, Loves Me Like a Rock. So on Loves Me Like a Rock, I am actually singing tenor. So huh. I, don't, I don't say I'm one voice or another. I am a singer. I am a vocalist. And I can probably sing just about anything you want to throw at me. And if I can't, <laughs> I'm going to learn it. I'm going to try and learn it. And there are things on my list that I want to try to learn. Yeah, we're never done. <laughs> what do you still want to learn? I want to learn some conical singing, some Indian singing, those rhythms. Uh, I'm a fan of Sheila Chandra and her speaking tongues work. Um, and mm. I want to learn a uh, uh, real salsa. I'm a fan of La India. And I want to sing in Spanish and, and really, really learn that groove and that idiom and that genre. Those are, those are my two things that are next on my list. Let's talk about how you became the musician that you are. Were you, were you born and raised in a musical family? Well, uh, they were not professional musicians, but um, my mom was a singer and a clarinet player, and she played piano. And my father uh, was a saxophone player and also mm. learned how to play piano after he retired. And um, both music lovers, and they played in many town bands and uh, orchestras. And my father had his own big band and his own trio. And so after retirement, music became a big part of their lives. And I honestly didn't know I was going to be a professional musician either. I thought I was going to go into the world of musical theater. But it was the, the path that, uh, that kept opening for me. And I had to start making some decisions as to what I was going to prioritize. And uh, it was the world of New York Voices that uh, became the priority and musical theater kind of fell to the side and singing backgrounds for pop singers kind of fell to the side and, uh, and New York Voices became the front runner. The origins of New York Voices are tied to your years at Ithaca College yes. where you were uh, undergraduate. Talk about those years. Yeah, we were uh, under the, uh, the leadership of Dave Riley. He was our mentor at that time. And um, I was an acting major at Ithaca, but I wanted to do as many musical performing things as I possibly could on campus. So mm. I said yes to just about everything and auditioned for everything. And if I didn't get in, I kept auditioning until I got in, if it was something that I wanted to do. And if I still didn't get in, I went and audited the class. So I was, no one was going to say no to me at that time in my life. Um, but I did actually get into the vocal jazz group when I was a freshman and I had four years with Dave Riley and uh, during that time we recorded demos for publishing companies. I started doing commercials at college. We recorded two records when I was there um, and it was in 86 that Dave Riley took an alumni group to the two festivals in Europe, to Montreux and North Sea. And that's when New York Voices was born. He gave us that name. And, uh, and that's when the nucleus of the group was formed, was in 1986. So describe the group. It's, it's now a quartet, but it was originally a quintet? Yeah, and correct? originally, originally, it was a sextet. 
There were okay. three men and three women when we first went to Europe, and uh, we just couldn't sustain that as a professional group. And when uh, we were trying to, to revamp when we came back to the United States, um, I, I didn't really want to be another quartet and, and compete with the incredible Manhattan Transfer. So I was like, oh my gosh, can't we just be five people? And, you know, and Darman has, you know, five notes to choose from for, for that harmony. And, uh, and so we all decided that, you know, we would try to go with five and we held our auditions and there were one, two, four of us from the original group, uh, Peter Eldridge, Darman Meter, myself and Caprice Fox. And, uh, and Sarah Krieger joined us to be the fifth voice when we first began. And then uh, after a few years, um, Sarah had had enough of life on the road and wanted to yeah. pursue other things. She's now a wonderful voiceover star in New York City. Um, and we were still in touch with her. It's really lovely. And, uh, and Lauren Kinnan took Sarah's place. And then after a while, Caprice was like, okay, I'm not sure I'm in for another record. And then she decided to spend more time with her family and, and uh, teach more music and that kind of thing. And, and we decided that we didn't want to go through the transition again. And we were fine being compared to Manhattan Transfer because that was always happening. And what an honor of, you know, for that to happen. Um, so we became a quartet and have stayed that way ever since. And what's the uh, instrumentation? That we work with? Yes. 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 Uh, more times than not, you will see us work with a rhythm section, piano, bass, and drums. Um, there are many times when you will see us with a big band. And, and we love being backed by big bands all over the world. And then there's the incredible occasion to actually stand in front of a symphony or an orchestra. And, uh, and those moments are becoming you know, further apart these days. It's not, not happening as much due to, to funding and that kind of thing. But when it does happen, it is just so magical. Um, so we have had those experiences. We have collaborated with the wonderful Paquito de Rivera, and we've gotten wow. to work with his rhythm section, which is just so well-versed in the Brazilian and Latin worlds, and also with the wonderful Ivan Lins and, and his rhythm section. And and that feels different too. It's just, it's so incredibly authentic and it is a, it's, it's like going to school. When you get to stand in front of the Count Basie Orchestra, uh -huh. you learn how to lay back and swing. When you are standing in front of Ivan Lins or Paquito's band, you feel every subdivision of the groove. You know, when you are standing in front of these incredible orchestras, you hear the harmonics, you feel the energy, you, you understand, you know, a different level of connection. So it's, we've been very, very fortunate to have uh, many musical backgrounds and, uh, and to have been able to uh, work with so many wonderful people. But you've also had the opportunity to write your own music as well. Well, I'm more of a lyricist than a composer. And I have, you know, I have arranging ideas. And uh, so uh, I have collaborated with my colleagues in New York Voices. I've collaborated right. with my husband, of course, uh, on my solo CD. I have collaborated with uh, another friend out of Boston. His name is Guillermo Nochichowicz. Uh, I'm a lead singer in his band, and I have uh, written lyrics for my other friend, Gabriel Espinosa. He's a, a Mexican bass player, and uh, so I've been able to collaborate with him. And uh, so there have been some, some, fun, some fun projects. I did a, a recording of uh, Japanese folk music that uh, was translated really? into English, yeah, so that children could learn English. And I did my own children's uh, project as well. So uh, I got to work on some lyrics with friends there too. So had my, my hands in a couple different pots. One of the things that, that has developed for you um, is uh, perhaps surprisingly, mm. you weren't anticipating it, is um, work as, as an educator and as a clinician. Yeah, because I never went to music school. 
And I am actually back at my alma mater. I am back at Ithaca College, helping to build that vocal jazz program there. Um, so yes, that's incredibly surprising to me. <laughs> but do you enjoy it? I do, and it is incredibly rewarding. Um, you know, there, there's one condition, and that's that the students have to meet me halfway. You know, they and and I'm I'm sure this is the same for all teachers. You can only give so much, you know, and you can't do the work for them. It's like it's you know it's like when you have your own children, you can't want it for them. They have to want it themselves, and they have to they have to bring, you know, their their passion to the party. So so yeah, that's my that's my only condition. <laughs> when you put on the jazz camps, mm. what's the uh, what's the syllabus like? Mm. Well, uh, when it's when it's in real time <laughs> when we are actually able to be together we actually mm -hmm. did our first virtual vocal jazz camp this past summer which was a huge success but the syllabus at our, our vocal vocal jazz camps um are usually tailored to the people that are coming we really we put out a swath of classes and we ask them what they would like to take and we we uh, choose the classes that seem to get the most votes and and we figure that out uh they can take songwriting classes they can take vocal technique they can take arranging they can take listening they can take improvisation they can take um i do a, a circle song of blues heads and a circle song of rhythm changes uh there's our you know our business classes health and maintenance there's everything as far mm. as classes are concerned uh, and that's kind of the morning in the afternoon uh, everyone is placed in a 16 voice choir so everyone is expected to learn and and perform two pieces at the end of the week with their 16 voice choir and that's just four rehearsals um, and everyone comes with two solo pieces too and uh, and if it's in good shape they are presented in the student showcase uh, there are concerts every evening, whether it's New York Voices or the hosting ensemble or the students. And then uh, on the last day, we kind of change it up and, and the whole camp is together the whole day and we bring in a special guest for a, a movement class. Uh, usually Darman Meter's wife, Lori Lynn Meter, will present a NIA class, um, which is a low impact movement dancing class. Um, we will do a, a question and answer session for the campers. We do a, a class called Side by Side, where every camper comes and stands next to New, a New York Voices and they sing 16 bars of the song that they know from New York Voices repertoire, which they have learned. So, and that's like Fast and Furious, uh, a side by side class. Um, all the choirs sing before all of the New York voices and just get a few comments from everybody. And then we do our student concert and then there's, it ends with a big New York voices concert. And the last day is a, a jazz brunch and we have our final presentation. So it is jam packed from 8.30 in the morning with warm ups to 10 o'clock at night is the last note of the concert. That happens four days, uh, four days of that. Uh, we have one night off and then one big day. So it's, it's full. <laughs> and, and how unique are the, the jazz camps? How unique? Well, they are as unique as the people are that come to them. They're, uh, people come from all over the world to our camps. Indonesia, Japan, Italy, Poland, Slovenia, Czech Republic. They come from everywhere, all across the United States, Canada. Um, and uh, every camp you know, kind of has its own energy and they seem to get better, whether they are live or virtual, we still mm -hmm. seem to generate this, this positive energy of music making. Um, and people, people grow and, you know, year to year, there's no audition. You, you, you never know what you're going to get. The only thing that people audition for are scholarships, which we have. Um, so everyone is welcome from the age of 14 to whatever. We've had people in their 70s and 80s come. So we've had multi-generations, 
you know, singing together. It's, oh, oh, I forgot one of the, one of the best things is uh, the all camp. Every year, uh, Greg Jaspers writes a new piece for our campers and they debut oh. a new song every year. And that's the all camp piece. And, and every year that song has a different message. So, yeah. Obviously, part of what burns inside you is the desire to, to, to take your skill set and your love of this music and this approach to music and making sure that it has a future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keeping the torch alive, fanning mm. the flames, right? And, and passing it on with love, respect, passion, care, um, respect. It's just, for me, it's, it's kind of the only way to do anything, whether it's music or it's your family recipes, or it's a great book, or it's a good movie. It's quality to me is, is everything. And, you know, I was raised as, you know, if you're not going to do your best, like, why bother? Why bother? Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're not going to, if you're not going to choose some of the best, if you're not going to work with some of the best, you know, so it's, it's, it's hopefully bringing the best out in, ev in every one. It's like any relationship. Hopefully it's like healthy, a healthy marriage that you bring out the best in each other. So as a teacher, I want to bring out the best in that musician, in that artist. I want to acknowledge what is sacred to them. I, I want to, I want to see their soul, touch their soul, experience them from, from the inside out. Yeah. Who were your idols growing up? Well, my idols growing up. Um, at the moment, I would say uh, Ella Fitzgerald. Oh, wow, yeah. For sure. Um, not, not, not so much growing up, but when I, you know, when I got to college and, and with New York Voices and when we, we really decided, or when I decided that I was going to have a life in jazz, um, every time I listened to an Ella Fitzgerald cut, I learned something more. And I could have listened, heard it a hundred times, but she, I continue to learn from her. There are solos that, you know, I continue to try to learn that I, I'm not sure that I'll ever master in my lifetime, but you keep trying. So yes, so Ella Fitzgerald, the school of Ella Fitzgerald for sure. Um, the voice of James Taylor. Really? Yes, yes, that voice speaks to me as much as anything, as any sound. When I hear James Taylor, I'm like, oh, okay, everything's going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that voice. Um, you know, but growing up, it was, you know, Stevie Wonder and Earth, Wind and & Fire and the Doobie Brothers. And, you know, I was a Casey Kasem kid. Every Sunday, I was listening to that Top 40. Top 40. I mean, getting out of church, the radio was on so I could listen to what was going on. Okay. Um, but, you know, growing up and watching those wonderful variety shows too with my family, whether it was, you know, Ed Sullivan or Lawrence Welk or um, Sonny and Cher or the Osmonds, Andy Williams, you know, all of those, uh, Dean Martin, Nat King Cole, you know, all of those wonderful, wonderful shows. I was glued as a kid right. watching watching these things. And I was a tap dancer too. So I started out tap dancing when I was five. So I, I was always dancing, tap dancing, tap jazz, ballet and point. I was choreographing. So if I wasn't singing music, I was dancing to music or I was listening to music and seeing things as a choreographer. So music was always a vital component. What about some of the uh, the voices, uh, the musicians that have captured your imagination today? The voices of today. Um, well, uh, Soril Ami, an incredible talent and, and improviser, 
uh, Joe Lowry from Australia, an incredible improviser. Um, uh, Veronica Swift, uh, who happens to be part Armenian, the daughter of Stephanie Nikasian. Bright, bright, bright future. John Pizzarelli, just an incredible person, musician, um, radio announcer, uh, personality. Just, I just, I love John. Um, other singers of today. That's perhaps an unfair question. Mm, yeah, there's um, a lot. There's a lot. And, you know, instrumentalists out there, too. One of my favorite instrumentalists is Sean Jones, a trumpet player, who I just think is the future of jazz. I just adore him and his playing. He's just an, an incredible man, incredible soul. Mm -hmm. there, there has been, I don't know if it, if if you find it still there, but but a sort of a, a dichotomy within the jazz world between there are those who are pure instrumentalists and, you know, sort of don't give the vocal element of jazz as much uh, um, seriousness as it ought to have. How do you, do you come across that and how do you negotiate that yeah sure i mean i think vocalists are constantly trying to validate <laughs> jazz vocalists validate themselves with uh instrumentalists and uh we take it as a high compliment when an instrumentalist uh listens to our music um and comments and enjoys what we do and actually wants to work with us um that's a that's a beautiful thing so we consider ourselves musicians and so we have been trying to bridge this gap yeah. since the day we formed and we continue to do that and i do think it's getting better um and and it's what we teach too it's like you know you don't want to fall into that dumb singer syndrome you know so we have to have the same skills we have to learn the same material it's what i'm pushing for for my vocal jazz majors it's what a lot of vocal jazz majors are graduating with now so they have this language they have this vocabulary they can speak the same language to instrumentalists and um and i do think we are bridging the gap and i would you know i ask any instrumentalist to try and try and sing go ahead sing it <laughs> Yeah, right. Bobby McFerrin is one of our greatest ambassadors for that, you know, and he has the orchestra sing their parts and it's, inc right. it's incredible, you know? So, um, so I think we all have a responsibility to this, to try and, uh, get rid of this ism and to, to validate the vocalist, but you have to, you know, put your money where your mouth is and you have to be able to deliver the way an instrumentalist delivers, you know, the way most instrumentalists deliver. And what are your current projects? What are you working on that's working filling on? your heart with joy? Ah, well, um, I am taking care of my father, my 87 year old father during COVID. So oh, yes. that brings me joy. Um, I am supporting my son in his third year at Oberlin College. That brings me joy. I have a home with my wonderful husband, Jay Ashby. That brings me joy. Um, I am writing uh, lyrics to one of my husband's melodies. I am writing lyrics to uh, Gabriel Espinosa's melodies for the, uh, next, for the next record to do with him. Um, and I am building material for my own project, for my own record. Uh, I am also writing my first book. I am writing a vocal technique book. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it might take me another six years. Who knows? But during this time at home and with the support of a good friend who just, you know, wants to stop hearing me talk about it and actually do it, um, <laughs> she's, she's helping me do that. So those are the projects that are on the fire right now. Well, look, Kim, we hope that in the not too distant future, 
you'll be able to come back and, and work with the, uh, the Houston Chamber Choir again because I know people loved oh. the, uh, the program when it you were here in so 2019. And I know I, I could write a book, yes. Yeah, we, we'd like to bring all the New York Voices down and do a, a collaborative thing with New York Voices and the Houston Chamber Choir. That's kind of another lingering dream. There are many dreams, and I hope people continue to dream and to dream big um, and to get to get through this pandemic on the other side and that uh, you know there will be some gold at the end of the rainbow I think for all of us. Well even in these dark times we can still get a great deal of joy th through singing can't we? Absolutely absolutely and it is what we do here in this actual room. Uh, my husband uh, will sit at the piano even though he's a trombone player and percussionist my son will play bass my father plays clarinet and I sing and we learn some of these old tunes that my dad knows and uh, we've presented them at both of our camps both the the USA New York Voices Vocal Jazz Camp and our European Vocal Jazz Camp and um, that definitely brings me joy yeah well look thank you very much for taking time to talk to us it's a great pleasure to, uh, to delve into your uh, musical life. Uh, thank you for uh, what you have taught the uh, Houston Chamber Choir. Mm. I know that, uh, that they will build upon that. And we do look forward to seeing you again in Houston or wherever else in the world the choir may be. Thank you very much. Truly, truly my pleasure. And I must say that that performance was one of the highlights of my career. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And thank you to everybody who supports the Houston Chamber Choir, whether you're a sponsor, a patron, or you just tune in and uh, listen to the podcast or watch on YouTube. Thank you very much for your support. We'll see you next time. I'm Sinjin Flynn. This is Behind the Music. The Houston Chamber Choir's With One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue to create new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org give.